Well, if you haven't noticed by this time, the Apostle John talks a whole lot about love. And so some have called him the, the love apostle or something like that. And, and really, if you think about it, he refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. You know, uh, he obviously is known as somebody who loved the Savior. And, you know, the, the picture always goes back to the, the Lord's Supper when John's there laying on, his, on Jesus' chest. And, you know, you, you, there's lots of things that you can think about with John and how he, he seems to really focus on love. Okay, and so 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, we're finishing up today with these uh, three letters over and over. Love, love, love. I mean, that's what it's about. And so even you can go to the Gospel of, of John, and that's where God so loved the world. I mean, he talks a lot about the love of God, and, and this is kind of what he focuses on. But the title of the message this afternoon is Loving in Truth. Loving in Truth. And so a lot of places in the Bible we could go uh, for, for that uh, con context there, but the Bible has a lot to say about love, and there's some things I want to consider before we get into this about love. Some of what I say might be a little repetitious from previous passages, but we're going to deal with what's here in this, this chapter. This is the chapter, the third epistle of John, the shortest book in the Bible, if you didn't know that, and so at least by some measurements. And so we're going to just try to stick with, I mean, I'm going to... I'm going to move around a lot, but we're going to stick with the context of what he's got here. And I'm just going to try to preach somewhat of an expository message here about uh, this passage. But I want you to notice a couple things before we get into this. Number one, lust is not love. And obviously our world, when it says love, you know, they don't half the time understand what love is. You know, uh, uh, I, remember when, <laughs> I remember when we were little kids, you'd say, oh, man, I love Skittles. Well, why don't you marry it? <laughs> right? Anybody remember that? Or that? <laughs> why don't you marry it? No, it's not that kind of love, right? But, but lo lust is not love, and sometimes it's confused. The Bible even uses the word love uh, when it's referring to uh, somebody having that kind of a feeling. The best example about that is uh, 2 Samuel. Look at 2 Samuel. You probably know where I'm going here. But in 2 Samuel... Amnon is said to have loved his half-sister, uh, Tamar. And 2 Samuel 13. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Now we know from reading this and knowing the story that he didn't love her, right? Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. And he said, I couldn't, he just couldn't figure out how he could get what he wanted from her that he loved so much. Well, we know he didn't love her. Look at verse 15, right? After he finally works out a, a way that he can have her because of his friend, quote unquote, which wasn't really a friend at all. And he said, uh, verse 15, then Amnon, this is after he got what he wanted, Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. Now, it wasn't love. We understand that. But this feeling sometimes that people have that they really want something, and then they just call that love. And I think about, you know, uh, you know, all the stories of young teenagers, you know, uh, saying, you know, well, I just love this person. And the parents are like, no, 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 you need to, well, you hate me. You just don't want me to have whatever I love and stuff like that. And so uh, there is, you know, a misconception a little bit about what love is. Now, I've mentioned this before. It's something I've brought up a lot. I think it's really important when understanding love. Love, uh, you know, is something that we can, it's going to have to do with our actions that we give towards somebody else. Not just a feeling, right? You can, you can use the word love. I love that. I really love that. But what we're talking about in love, the kind of love that God wants us to have toward one another, and all I'm going to get to in a minute, that is uh, something that's going to require that we do something for the one that we love, okay? And so if you are in a position of authority and you love those who are under you, you're going to be merciful and just and, and, and show grace towards them because you love them. If you're 
in a, you love your the person who's in your authority, you know, like your boss or your parents or whatever, you're going to love them and show your love by submitting to their authority and honoring them and all that kind of stuff. But the way that we show love to somebody is going to involve uh, an action, okay? Love is not letting people do whatever they want to do. In fact, quite the opposite. It tends most of the time that the real way to show somebody love is not just to give them whatever they want, but to actually say, no, I know you're going to be mad at me for this, but that's going to hurt you. I don't want you to do that, right? And so, uh, you know, how many times at the door have we talked about that? If you have children, maybe you've used this analogy in talking about the love that God has to his children, right? And how he's going to chasten his children that he loves. And, you know, I might say something about, hey, my child uh, could run across the street and I'm going to chase them down and I'm going to get them and I'm going to spank them and say, don't you run across the street. You're going to get hit by a car. Now, if the neighbor kids do that, I might say, hey, don't do that. You're going to get, where's your parents? You know, <laughs> But it's not going to be the same because I don't have that same affection, that same love, that same sense of responsibility and care and nurture that I'm going to say, no, you got to do and so I'm going to spank them and I'm going to say, hey, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And they don't believe it, but <laughs> you're going to do it because you love them and you want to uh, make sure that they learn what, what you're trying to uh, teach them. And so we understand that, that sometimes some people call it tough love, right? The kind of love that's not just easy going, just let people do whatever they want to do. That's actually not love at all. We've already talked about that a little bit. But in the text here of 3 John, I want to talk about a uh, real simple outline, okay? How do we love? Who do we love? And why do we love? Okay, so number one, how do we love? Now, I've already mentioned this uh, in previous chapters. First and second John tell us that we cannot love without keeping the commandments. Remember me talking about that? Look at 1 John 5, 1. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God because we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Chapter uh, 2, I mean, I mean not chapter 2, 2 John chapter 1. Look at verse 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we, uh, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Okay, and so, see again, now we're getting into the third letter. What's he say about love? Well, look at verse 1 there. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Okay, loving in truth, that's a little bit different maybe than just loving. Uh, well, let's look at, uh, let, let's look at, uh, here's another way that you could, you can consider. Look at 1 John 3, 18. 1 John 3, 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Okay, so you could look at it like this and say, when you love somebody in truth, in other words, it's not just all about the, what I say. Like I say I love them, but I'm not really demonstrating it, saying love them in truth, all right? But I think there's a little bit more to that. I think uh, well, we could look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave some, talking about Jesus and, and what he left for the church, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ." that we henceforth be not, no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with ever wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby we lie, uh, they, they lie in wait to deceive. Interesting, once again, uh, this is consistent. First John, Second John, every time they talk about loving God 
and loving God by keeping the commandments and loving God in, and loving other people in truth. It always goes on to say, because some have crept in unawares, because some have, you know, are going about deceiving. So something about loving the brethren, uh, I'm going to get to that in a minute, who to love, right? But something about the people that we love is protecting them from going down the road of heresy, protecting them from going into false teachings and stuff like that. And you can see where it's kind of all, all linked together. But look at the next uh, verse there in Ephesians 4. All right, so he says, There are some whereby they lie in wait to deceive, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. Now, the title of the message was Loving in Truth, and this kind of swaps it around, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Okay, so, man, the, the work of God in God's people loving one another, which should be second nature, right? It should be something that we just naturally do. Uh, the work is going to have to do with sometimes saying things and speaking the truth, even if it's not popular. It's going to come with, by, uh, you know, uh, by some actions that might seem harsh or whatever, but we're in keeping commandment with God, God's law, because that is love, right? And so uh, uh, some of these things, uh, you know, might seem, you know, not what the world thinks about love, but guess what? The world doesn't know how to love. Right. The world doesn't understand true love because God is love. And you have to be born of God to truly understand how to love somebody. And so, uh, so first of all, how do we love? Well, we should always love in truth. We should always love in truth, okay? And uh, secondly, we should always wish that the person that we love, if we really love them, we should wish that they would prosper. Look at verse 2. Beloved, I'm back in 3 John now. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Okay? So he's wishing good upon Gaius, his well-beloved. Okay? And he's saying, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth, uh, you know, it should be our desire. Those that we love, obviously, we want them to have good health. We want them to be prosperous within reason. <laughs> we don't want somebody, uh, you know, maybe gaining a new job or gaining a lot of riches that's going to take them away from God or out of, out of church. Obviously, that would be a bad thing. But we understand if they're growing, if they're, if they're learning. I just, uh, on the way up here, we were talking about somebody because we found out uh, the hard way, I guess, through experience, that all these people, uh, many, many people that we went to school with, Bible college, had plans of being in the ministry and all this, and somehow down the road, the wife decided, I need to go to school. I need to go to university, or I need to go <laughs> some kind, and I need to be a nurse, or I need to be something. And every time we were thinking, why? I don't understand. What, what is the, what are they going after? You know, and, uh, and the, the husband would say, well, yeah, I guess I can see that. And I don't want to hold you back. I mean, I love you. I want you to be able to do whatever you want to do. But you follow that down the road, and we've seen case after case after case. Valley and I were thinking about all the people that we've seen uh, in the ministry and, and, uh, and just in the churches that we've been to that did this, decided she's like, I got to go get a career. Maybe we need two incomes or we need something. And it's really weird. It's always after they have like three, four children or their family's growing. And then she feels like she has to get a career. And we're thinking, well, who's going to watch the kids? What's going to... Every time they end up in divorce. I mean, every time they end up in divorce, she ends up following her career. The kids go to grandma. And it's just a big mess. Every time. Every time. So, so we were recently thinking uh, about a particular person. And I, and I said, not trying to be gossipy or anything, but I really worry about them. I worry about them because they seem to be following that same pattern. And now she had this desire to go do these different things. And a genuine love for them, you know, if, they, if they're like, yeah, hey, I just got accepted into this school or something like that, you're thinking, ooh, I don't think that's a good idea, right? A genuine love is like, I don't want that to happen. So recently, this person, the person that we were talking about actually broke their arm. And it was a severe break. She had to cancel classes and stop doing that. And we're thinking, man, that could have been God stopping her from really damaging her family. And this is something to be thankful for. You think, oh, you really love them. You're thankful they broke their arm. Yeah, because that might have kept them out of something a lot worse. 
you know. And so sometimes we got to think about that when it comes to love. We love them in truth. We love them in wishing good for them, that they would prosper in a godly prosperity. <laughs> you understand? Sometimes losing things in this world and losing money or whatever is actually helping them profit spiritually. We're, we're happy about it. <laughs> you know, we're happy to see them something happen in their life that's going to bring them closer to God because uh, that's what you know, we should be praying for. Not that they would lose things necessarily, but praying that God's will be done and that He stops them from uh, getting into different harm, uh, harm's way. So the, and then also we should rejoice when we know that they walk in truth. All right, that should be our ultimate desire. Hey, they're growing, they're learning. Uh, there was another thing we talked about on the way up here. Man, I can look, I have sermon material on the drive up here. <laughs> another thing we were talking about is uh, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. No, I threw off my train of thought. What was I saying? Okay, uh, okay, yeah, I was saying about uh, the things that I've been investing in in Iola, right? And it's not that it's not that they. They needed me to show them this or something like that. But since I've been the pastor, there are certain things that I feel like, you know, it's just it's just going to come with repetition, just saying it over and over, teaching it over and over, you know, instructing over and over. We got to do this. We got to do this. And I won't get into all the specifics. But and uh, and we're thinking, yeah, if if I keep doing that, if I keep on investing and I keep on saying, look, this is right, this is wrong in time, it's just going to be natural. It's going to be in their heart. It's going to be on their tongue, and they're just going to say, hey, you know what's right? And it's not so much that they're going to say, well, you know, Pastor Rocky taught us this or that. I don't even care if I get credit for it. It's just all of a sudden I see them doing the right thing, and I'm like, Whew, I'm so glad to see my children walk in truth. I'm so glad to see them doing right. You know, that's what should bring me joy, not that I get credit for it or that, uh, uh, you know, that there's some kind of prosperity or some name that's given. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about walking with the Lord. And so he says right there, he says, I wish above all things thou mayest be pros uh, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly. Now, verse three, if you didn't, if you didn't know where I went there, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children Walk in truth. Now, some people have uh, of uh, some people have tried to say that Gaius was actually John's child. I don't necessarily believe that. I kind of get to that in a minute, but uh, let me just jump in then to the second point. So, first of all, was how do we love? All right, we love in truth. We wish we wish others would prosper in a godly way. We rejoice whenever they walk in truth. Who do we love? Okay, this is this is obvious in the text here, verse four. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Well, first of all, we need to love our children, okay? And so, again, there's where I was going. Sometimes people will say, I think maybe John had a son. His name was Gaius, and he's actually talking about his, his, his son. They do the same thing with Paul. There, Paul says, so-and-so, my son. And they say, oh, Paul must have had a child. <laughs> you know. And so uh, I don't believe that. I believe probably what he's talking about here is he's saying to the person that he's ministered to, and really, all of us, I, as a pastor, I can I can probably relate to this really really easily. But it's but it's true for every single one of you. Somebody that you minister to, somebody that you've been working on, you've been investing in. You think the Lord has put them in your life for you to help teach and and, and help them grow. Look, you begin to treat that person as that they're your child in the faith. Like you know you've you you're investing in them as though you're their child. Look at Second Corinthians six. 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 11 says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now, for a recompense in the same and then in parentheses, it says, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. You see, he was saying, I'm speaking to you as though you're my children, because that's how he feels about them. Look over in Philemon. Philemon, great. Great book of the Bible. We don't, we don't hear preached a whole lot, probably.
fact, I'm having a hard time finding it. There it is. <laughs> Philemon. Look at verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who I have begotten in my bonds. Now, you can't say Onesimus was his son. You read between the lines and you find out that Onesimus was Philemon's slave, and he ran away. Okay, and so Paul ended up in uh, in a ministering situation. You know, through his bonds, uh, he ends up meeting Onesimus. And he, uh, and he says, I've begotten him in my bonds. I'm guessing that means he led him to the Lord, began to invest in him, began to uh, help him grow. And now he says, now what you need to do is you need to go back to Philemon. And so he sends this letter to Philemon and says, hey, you need to accept uh, Onesimus, my son. And he's saying, you know, accept him back. If he, he owes anything, lay that on my account and all this kind of stuff. Great story. But he's talking about him and calling him his son. And I think that's all he's talking about. And when he says children, he does the same thing with uh, uh, Timothy. He says, there, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so, uh, you know, he, he's investing in him. He's helping him. He's, he's helping him to grow. He's, he's doing all these things, right? Loving him in truth. Not afraid to tell him the hard things, the hard sayings that need to be, to be said. He's uh, rejoicing to watch him prosper. He's rejoicing to watch him walk in truth and all these kinds of things. Okay, so uh, first of all, who do we love? We love our children, and that's not just physical children, although that's norm, that's obvious. Also, our spiritual children. We love uh, also, notice it says uh, in verse 5, back in 3 John, verse 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Okay, so... We see also uh, you gotta love, we have to love our brethren, and this includes strangers, okay? Look at this, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow, help, uh, fellow helpers to the truth. So what he's saying is, Fellow believers, right? These are our brethren. Uh, I talked about this this morning. Can you imagine? Jesus said, you know, and, and he did this for a specific reason. He's got a multitude of people thronging him, trying to get his miracles, trying to get him to heal them and all. And, uh, and nobody can get through. Man, it's, it's, just, it's just standing room only. They can't get to him. And so all of a sudden, his mother and his brothers come and say, we need to talk to Jesus. Hey, Work your way in there and tell him that his mother and his brothers are out here. And so he goes and does that. What does Jesus say? He says, who are my mother and my brother? And he looks at all these guys and says, behold, my mother and my brother. Those who do the will of God right, are my, bro my mother and my brother and my sister. And so, you know, and I preached a message this morning on the family of God. And you know that we are all, this is, this is just so amazing. I, I took him to Genesis chapter 12 and related that to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 3, where we're all, this is Abraham's seed, you know, and by faith, by faith we're born into the family of God. And so the family of God, just it's not just Iola, you know, it's not like just like, oh, we have our family right here, you know, right in this little minute, we have our family. Okay, we'll include the Iola. We got Iola and we got Kansas City Mission. This is our family. No, in many ways it is. It's it's a, it's a uh, uh, it's a a part of the family that's a little bit distinct from other parts of the family because we believe in a local church. But uh, but really, if I go to Africa and I meet a saved brother, guess what? Family. He's my brother in Christ. My sister, my mother. Right. This is the family of God. We're all part of the family of God because we're in Christ. And so uh, and so that that's kind of the the case with. The church, I've put it this way before, uh, when we did the Lord's Supper, I put it this way, uh, you know, my sister uh, is my family, we're related and we're, we're family, but my house, right, although we're all related, my house, I'm, I'm responsible to them to set the rules and all that, so that would be the, like the local church as opposed to another local church, but we're still family. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ as long as uh, we've been born of God. And so we're to love them, but it also strangers. When we're out soul winning and we find somebody that is saved 
isn't it just encouraging just to know that, hey, another believer. I've been knocking on all these doors. Everybody's saying works, works, works. And then I found this believer. And how often, you know, they might not even go to the same type of church we do. <gasps> you can't fellowship with them. Look, they're believers. You know, I, I'm, I hate that they go to another church that might teach them, you know, wrong on some certain issues, but they believe the gospel the same. They put their faith in Jesus Christ the same. And isn't it neat how you kind of have that common bond? And sometimes they'll say, hey, can I get you some, some water? Can I pray with you? You know, I'm so glad to see you guys doing that because we're brothers and sisters. And so we need to be aware of that. And we need to have love not only for our children and the ones that we're investing our time and effort into, not only our brethren that we we worship with on a regular basis, but also what we would call the strangers in that category. And so uh, pretty much believers, okay? Now I'll get to the, the end of the chapter here in a little bit and talk about those who uh, we don't love. Okay, but number three, uh, why do we love? All right, we know who we love. We know, uh, we know how we love them. Why do we love them? He says it in verse seven. Because that, for his name's sake, they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Well, what is the truth? The Word of God, right? Who is it that we're actually concerned about? Jesus and His name's sake, right? So why do we love our fellow brothers and sisters? Well, because we love the Lord. What did He say? Uh, uh, I don't remember the exact verse here. Let's see if I can mess this up. Chapter uh, 1 John chapter 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth Him that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. Look, it's your brother. It's your sister. You love them because they are fellow helpers. We're working together for a cause. You ever notice people that work together for the same cause show love toward one another? Look, I don't care if it's Antifa, <laughs> Antifa, however you pronounce it. Black Lives Matter, you know, you know, it could be wicked. It could be wicked people. But you know what? They rally around the LGBT community. Isn't that weird? Like the LGBT community says, we accept, blah, blah, blah. what are you talking about? They're, these are just wicked people that are everywhere. Yeah, but they have a commonality, right? And so therefore they show love towards one another. What did Romans 1, say? Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Look, they run with their own crowd. They, they, can, uh, they, they get together and start talking about these wicked things, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. So they become brothers <laughs> and sisters and, uh, in, in their wickedness. Look, how about the uh, brotherhood? Now, these aren't necessarily wicked, but the brotherhood of uh, police officers, right? If you join the police force with perfect strangers, you don't know anything about them, like you might not necessarily have a love for them, but once you start working with them and you're out, you know, enforcing the same things, maybe taking some fire uh, together, you know, and you're hiding behind your car and having a shootout with somebody else, you guys are on the same team. Guess what? Now they're your brother and you love them. That's why they call it a brotherhood. Uh, there was a short amount of time in my life where I thought, and this is what, like right after I ran the, my first hundred mile or so, I thought like, man, I'm super fit, man. I need to do something with this. And I was like, ah. I had a cleaning business at the time. And I was like, yeah, I wonder if I can be a firefighter and still go to school and still, <laughs> you know, do all the work in the church and all the things I'm doing. And so I started looking into it and I, I decided to try out. I was really interested in the the physical fitness part of the test. And I was like, I'm going to do that, man. It's, uh, and have I ever told you a story, man? It was, it was actually pretty fun. It was challenging. Yeah, I threw up afterwards, man. <laughs> it, was, it was hard work. And, uh, and I passed the, I did lousy on the written part, but I, I did the pretty good on the physical part. And I remember studying that and thinking, you know, what, what's it going to involve to be a, uh, a firefighter? And I thought, man, you're going to have to live with these people on a regular basis. You're going to have to walk into burning buildings and be like, hey, you got my back. I got your back. And this is why those firefighters call each other brothers. And it's a brotherhood. Right? Why? Because that, doesn't that make sense? You're working with them. You've got the same cause, the same purpose, and so you become brother. How about Freemasons? I don't know anything about them, but I know that they do this. They put their shirt, their hand inside the shirt. <laughs> and that's some kind of sign, right, to signify the other. You've heard that story. Uh, but it is true. If you join the fraternity, 
you know, and you get into the Mason, don't do it, but I'm just saying, if you did that, all of a sudden, yeah, it is. All of a sudden, if you got into that club, right, hey, I got your back, you know, we're going to use your services, your business, we're going to make sure your business gets more, uh, uh, more traffic and all that stuff, because why? They're part of the same club, they've got the same cause, whatever that is, and they want to uh, be part of a team, so they naturally begin to love each other. So don't you think that should be the case for believers who are working together for the same cause, the biggest cause and the best cause there is, right? E giving uh, people eternal life. <clears throat> Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. When we walk in the Spirit... Now look, I'm not saying that every time just because somebody else is saved that you're going to naturally love them and want to die for them and want to give them everything, okay? But when you walk in the Spirit and you're saying, hey, all my affection is on Christ. I want to serve Christ. And then you meet somebody else who says, I want to serve Christ. I love Christ. It's my, you know what? You don't even have to say, hey, somebody teach me how to love that person. According to the Bible, you don't, nobody has to teach you that. If you're walking in the Spirit, you just know, hey, we're serving the same cause. We got the same desire, and you're just naturally going to love them. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in uh, all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. It should be natural that we have a desire to be around our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. It should be natural that, I mean, uh, uh, this was the point of the message this morning, but Jesus said, look, if you don't hate your mother and your father and your brother, your sister, and your own life also, he throws that in there as well. He says, you're not fit to be my disciple. He's not saying you can't go to heaven unless you're willing to forsake all things. But he's saying, if you're going to follow Christ, and you're saying, hey, you know what? Nothing else matters to me. I'm going to follow Christ. Uh, then, you know, all of a sudden, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my... It, it changes, doesn't it? So all of a sudden, your biological family doesn't really matter as much. I mean, like I told them this morning, I said, it's nice when you have the best of both worlds and your, your biological family actually are saved and, and love the Lord as well. Right. But not everybody has that luxury. And so at some point you have to say, you know what? They refuse my 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 flesh and blood refuse. Now, you still got to honor, and respect them in the way that the Bible tells you to. But you say at some point, my flesh and my blood has is going the other direction, you know. And so I'm joining up with these who are my brothers and my sisters in Christ. Amen. And we're a part of a family, the family of God. And the Holy Spirit just, hey, it just puts that in you, man. You don't even really have to say, well, I just wish I could learn how to love my brothers and sisters more than I love the things of the world, more than I love my own flesh and blood family that's not serving God. Well, look, it's going to be a battle because you're flesh and blood. But if you walk in the Spirit, no one has to teach you, man. You just know. You just have a love for them. You want fellowship. You want to be to, uh, together with them and desire them. So finally, go back to first, uh, 3 John. The rest is just kind of conclusion here. There are some people uh, that he now talks about who we don't necessarily have love for. All right. Look at verse 9. Oops, where am I at here? I wrote unto the church... But Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither do, uh, doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that hath good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. And then he says some good things about Demetrius and all. But here's what I want to just point out, the last thing. And this is, again, somewhat repetitious because it keeps coming up over and over. But how true it is and how much we see this consistency in the Bible, that if you love the Lord, then you're going to hate what he hates. You're not going to love the things that he doesn't love. 
And why, and, and, and why do we see this, okay? What is the big deal about, uh, uh, not Demetrius, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Diotrephes. What's the big deal about Diotrephes? Well, what, didn't he call himself a brethren? Well, yeah, what's the Bible say about people that call themselves your brethren and they're drunkards and they're fornicators and they're covetous and all these kinds of things? Hey, don't even eat with them. They're calling themselves your brother, but what are they doing? They're hurting the brotherhood, right? And we don't want to, we don't want to engage in that and to, uh, and to help that. Why? Look, it's cliche, but, and you hear it all over and over again, but because if you love the flowers, you hate the weeds. You hate the thorns. You hate all the things that are going to kill those flowers. You want the flowers to continue to grow, so therefore you got to pluck out all the bad stuff. you got to pluck out the weeds and all that kind of stuff. And so he's saying this about Diotrephes. He's saying, look, he loves to have the preeminence. He, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's hindering people uh, who would, right? He's, uh, Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would. And casteth them out of the church, like he's like just hindering people from coming to the gospel. I mean, coming to Jesus, and and he and he's you know probably uh, making it to where people cannot receive the Lord. And so he says, "Look, I have no love for that person. I love the brotherhood, and because I love the brotherhood, I don't love those people that are harming the brotherhood." And so this is what a lot of even Christians don't understand about the biblical concept of love. Right? Because we're supposed to love one another, so they start thinking, well, love just means you just tolerate everybody. No, no, no. The Bible never says love is tolerate. Never, love doesn't mean coexist with other religions and, and people that would be contrary to God and God's people. No, the Bible makes it clear uh, that loving is something that we do when we're all in the same focus and we're heading in the same direction and we have the same goal in mind, which is to lift up the name of Jesus. Okay, Anybody that would try to hinder that, look, they're not on our side. We don't have a love for them. And, uh, and so that's a hard concept for some people to grasp, and they sound like you're hateful for saying that. Uh, but look, this is the biblical concept. When it says we're supposed to love one another, there's a reason we love one another, okay? Because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got the same purpose in mind. So the only group that we, should, we shouldn't show love to are the ones who are causing harm to other believers or hindering the work of the Lord. Right. It makes sense. If you love them, you don't love the things that are going to hinder them from being what? Prosperous, walking in truth, uh, uh, you know, uh, and yeah, being being prosperous and all uh, spiritually prosperous. And so this is what we want uh, to to desire for for one another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. For these letters in John, we finish this up for a second, third John. We learn so much about love and how love can never uh, replace keeping your commandments and serving you, but actually it goes hand in hand. Lord, we don't even know how to love except you put it in us and teach us how to love. And so naturally we have a love for the brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and Lord, I pray that if any of us, our flesh gets in the way, and uh, there's something about our fellow brothers or sisters that we don't, we're not loving like we ought to. Lord, I pray that you help us get that right and walk in the Spirit. And then if we're loving things that we shouldn't love, things of this world, things that would hinder um, the gospel from being uh, effective and, and growing, Lord, I pray that you help us get those things out of our lives and continue to walk in love and to love in truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.